Welcome Climate Viewers. My name is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at climateviewer.com, climateviewer.org, and weathermodificationhistory.com. Today is June 7th, 2018, and we're going to talk about chemtrails from space. Um, a lot of people talk a lot about aluminum and barium, um, and they talk about chemtrails. And 95% of them, when they're talking about aluminum and barium, uh, they're talking about coming out of Delta Airlines and, you know, commercial flights. But I think the people are missing the big picture here. So what tonight we're going to talk about is what I believe to be the biggest source of aluminum and barium coming from the sky, chemtrails from space, or sounding rockets. Um, many of you probably never heard of a sounding rocket, so we're going to break that down in graphic detail. Um, before we do that, I just want to mention that everything you're about to see is open source, free of charge, and advertisement free. Um, I only ask that you uh, support me monthly on Patreon, or if you would like to give a one-time donation on PayPal. Uh, that's the only compensation I get for the seven years of research you're about to see. Um, and we're really going to get to the names, addresses, and details behind where's all this aluminum and barium really coming from. Um, now, I wrote this article back in 2015, Aluminum, Barium, and Chemtrails Explained Just the Facts. And... My intention was to really kind of, you know, give a primer on what I see to be the bigger issue, the, the little known world of rockets and shooting aluminum and barium into space. You know, as above, so below, and what goes up must come down. So that's really the issue here tonight is they've been shooting aluminum and barium and lithium and strontium and sulfur hexafluoride and all kinds of metals into space for well over 60 years and nobody knows about it to this day um so let's really break it down get to the details um this is an educational piece so take notes by the way this is going to be recorded uh for posterity and available on climateviewer.com in perpetuity but regardless, I want to update some of this information. So, is there aluminum and barium coming from planes? Yes, even the IPCC has a special section on metal particles coming out of planes. And they say things such like aluminum, titanium, chromium, iron, nickel, and barium are estimated to be present in the parts per billion uh, by volume as the nozzle exiting the planes and this is based on two estimates from 1975 pretty pathetic um yeah so i went to the us epa and i complained about just that you know metal particulates coming out of planes and how they make clouds and they were not too happy about that brought some of my friends with me you should watch the video it's hilarious but just in the jet fuel, we do see that aluminum is present. Barium is present. Aluminum is um, three times higher since NATO switched from JP5 to JP8. So there's a huge increase in aluminum alone. 28 countries simultaneously switched their jet fuel. And uh, calcium went from 5,000 to 31,000 parts per billion. Strontium from 70 to 351, titanium from 35 to 1056. So, yes, all of these metals um, tripled, doubled, quadrupled, you know, just from jet fuel. And I've got some other stuff about how they're using biofuels with blended portions of aluminum nanoparticles in it. So, yes, aluminum should be used judiciously because they tend to entrain in human bodies and especially brains um, alzheimer's being linked to the direct ingestion of uh, aluminum through the nasal passages my nose is itching as i'm doing this video uh, regardless this is a serious concern and of course i've got here barium compounds serve as corrosion rust inhibitors detergent anti-smoke additives in jet fuels 
So, yes, barium and aluminum are in jets. This is from the USCDC. Barium compounds are used in oil and gas, drilling muds, automotive paint, stabilizers for plastics, case hardening steels, bricks, tiles, lubricating oils, and jet fuel. So, yes, barium and aluminum are in jet fuel, but they pale in comparison to rockets. And this is the one that really stuck out for me. Each time the space shuttle is launched, a solid rocket booster releases 240 tons of hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric gas, 26 tons of chlorine gas, 7 tons of nitrogen dioxide gas, and 304 tons of aluminum oxide. Now, planes don't weigh 304 tons alone. Um, so that was a major aha moment for me. Wait a minute. So every time I was watching the space shuttle go off, um, 304 tons of aluminum coming out of it. Now there's a major source of aluminum in the sky. So I started looking to this deeper and I came up with the title Kim Trails from Space to talk about things called sounding rockets because not only does the space shuttle produce all this aluminum, it produce, produces acid rain and hydrochloric acid so strong that it literally kills fish and melts, um, you know, destroys paint on cars. And the, the even the concrete bases that they were launching from, it would melt the concrete. That's how strong this stuff is. But I did a video series on this. You can see Chemtrails from Space Part 1, the past, 1950 to 1978, followed up by uh, 1978 to present, and then a whole bunch of videos on, you know, sounding rockets. But let's get into the details of this. And I'm going to use weathermodificationhistory.com and a couple other things to show this off. So... The Argus experiment by Nic Nicholas Christophilos, 1958, where they discovered the Christophilos effect by blowing up nuclear explosions in space. Um, this relate, yes, tons, Diane, 304 tons of aluminum oxide just out of the solid rocket boosters from the space shuttle. And, you know, I, I you know, have a let's see i'll bring this up real quick since it's a, i have a question in chat this is live um what we'll do is we'll hop over here and i'll just go show you my launch notifications rocket launches and as you can see right here in my email inbox these are launch notifications from analytical graphics and you can see that they're launching rockets every single day so these, these rocket launches um, go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And so I keep up with the rocket launches. But regardless, um, every time these rockets are launched, they're punching holes in the ionosphere and they're dumping massive amounts of metal particulates in the sky. So people are so focused on airlines putting aluminum and barium into the sky, but nobody's talking about sounding rockets. So let's, let's see what... Harry Wexler had to say about that. Um, he actually warned uh, back in the day in a paper written by a personal hero of mine, James Fleming, on the possibilities of climate control in 1962, Harry Wexler on geoengineering and ozone destruction. And he said the subject of weather and climate control is now becoming respectable to talk about. <laughs> Um, and he goes on to talk about that, you know, early and comprehensive study in light of developments in outer space and the possibility of large scale weather modification using rockets. So, uh, to accompany this little written document, uh, he did, uh, Dr. Jim Fleming, a PowerPoint. And when you flip through this, you see there's Harry Wexler, Woods Hole, um, 1956 um, and a couple maps some radio signs and stuff radar atmospheric nuclear explosions there's a there's their, one of your first sounding rocket experiments 1950 bumper v2 
And uh, anyway, there's Wexler with Von Neumann, Charney and others, 1954, um, launching satellites into space, Wexler on skis in Little America. Oh, they were shooting sounding rockets off down there. Um, but I could go through all this. Wexler hanging out with Lyndon Johnson and, and, and Robert Kennedy. Now, of course, both of these individuals talked about weather control. Um, Kennedy specifically said we want the United Nations to all agree to work together on weather control but Lyndon Johnson said from space the masters of infinity will be able to control the world's weather and cloud layer um, and things like create drought and all of that um, very creepy stuff coming out of Lyndon Baines Johnson um, and you can see there's Harry Wexler right there in the background um, but anyway so this was the paper that he was going to give a speech on modification of the earth's upper atmosphere by missiles and you know he also wrote the paper on the possibilities of climate control in 1962 and you know he went on to talk about you know the different types of things bromine you know how they would affect world's temperature effect on temperature effect on radiation and or albedo geoengineering um, and rates of dispersal and all that sort of stuff um, damage to stratospheric ozone increased pollution from rocket exhaust near space experiments could go awry unknown risk from operation Argus project Westford the needles they put in space project high water where they dumped water from an Atlas rocket um, the list goes on and on but the possibility for military interest in waging geophysical warfare by attacking the ozone layer over a rival nation. Punching a hole in the ozone layer to literally fry people on the ground. Mmm, that's pretty scary stuff. So, Wexler 1962, prevent all ozone from forming. A little note right there. And uh, how it, sunlight is destroyed. And this is the Rosetta Stone, as he puts it. Um, Wexler's Rosetta Stone note linking Chapman, Wolf, rocket fuel, and ozone destroying reactions triggered by chlorine and bromine catalysts. So, while we were all blamed for CFCs and these chemicals burning a hole in the ozone layer, Harry Wexler warned that sounding the rockets and sounding rockets in these space weather experiments were tearing a hole in the ozone and that they could lead to steering the jet streams to worldwide weather control. That's what Lyndon Baines Johnson said. Um, big stuff big stuff indeed so we come over here to weather modification history let's go right back to the article real quick there's Harry Wexler of course he died before he could give this speech of a sudden heart attack and what happens magnetic magnetospheric modification begins almost immediately where they patch of Aurora ionized in the atmosphere by heating trapped energetic particles cloud of plasma released by satellite not just rockets so they shoot a rocket up there and then they make a satellite that can dump aluminum and barium in space as well pretty scary stuff indeed um and what do you know the rand corporation wrote this article pollution of the upper atmosphere by rockets and uh he says, these, these last conclusions have implication for future tracer experiments using these substances. That, hey, even though he warned us that we shouldn't do sounding rockets, maybe we should do some more because it's a great idea. So the RAND Corporation was like, more sounding rockets, great idea, space weather control, all that. Let's do this thing. Um, and that's where the story begins back in the 60s. Artificial strontium and barium clouds in the upper atmosphere, 1966. And we're going to go over to weathermodificationhistory.com now. 
So what I did was I pulled up the sounding rocket section. As you can see right here, just click on the sidebar on sounding rockets and you're gonna see what I'm seeing. And this is where the plasma seeding and magnetospheric modification begins. Plasma seeding is like cloud seeding. It's just done in space. So instead of seeding the sky to make rain, they seed space to make it rain energetic particles. Um, that's called plasma seeding or space weather modification. Um, and then you can see right here, this is when upper atmospheric nuclear explosions were banned, artificial strontium and barium clouds in the upper atmosphere, link, link, and that picture right there. This is a barium cloud. Of course, it's black and white going to see some nice color photos of those in just a minute. Um, but this is something that's very serious that nobody's talking about. And that's why we're bringing it up here today. Now, everybody's heard of HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. You know, the one up in Gakona, Alaska. It's right over here. This HARP right here. So this is the ionospheric heater up in Gakona, Alaska. This is on climateviewer.org. And all you got to do is come over here to the atmospheric sensor and EMF sites and click on High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project. Uh, links in the details already. So you can click on the map and check this out. But did you know that there was a HARP in 1965 called Project High Altitude Research Program. I mean, that's practically the same freaking name. The only difference is cannons launch chemical payloads into space. What? So it wasn't just, you know, rockets. They were using guns with, you know, some of them with chemical payload rockets in them. But this harp cannon in space looked like this. There it is. Five and 16 inch guns. And here's a Martlet 2C with and without chemical Sabo. There's a guy holding a 5.1 inch harp rocket that shoots chemicals like aluminum and barium into space from the ground and glide pass of the different ones. Some of these you can see kilofeet apogee, 600 kilofeet at 7,000 feet per second. So they could fire this gun to shoot um, aluminum and barium into the upper atmosphere. Here's a hole in the ground from where one of those landed. I love this photo, it's kind of funny. Dude with a steel rake looking like, what the heck? Typical depression resulting from impact of Martlet 2C. Hey man, somebody shot a damn rocket and it blew a hole in the ground. But that's harp from 1965. Little known fact. Moving along, sounding rockets and explosive shells pound ionosphere 1970 through 1975. Up in this bad boy, we've got ARPA Project Secede, Observation and Development of Striations in Large Barium Ion Clouds, Amount of Contract, $283,000, 1972, Rocket Energy Beams Create Artificial Aurora, 1972, ARPA Project Secede 2, Barium Cloud Releases, 1973, NASA Skylab launch knocks out radio communication over Atlantic Ocean. Mm, Atlas rocket, boring holes in the ionospheric hole affects radio transmissions. Mandelo et al., 1975, we does our research, we do's. Um, November 4th, 1974, high explosive shaped barium charges pound ionosphere. Links, 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 links. And here's what those look like. So there's Project Secede with the large barium ion clouds, 1973. Secede 2. 
artificial aurora conjugate to a rocket rocket born electron accelerator you gotta love these titles right and here's where NASA Skylab was launched and it knocked out radio transmissions over the um, ocean gotta love that uh, conjugate magnetic field line tracing experience with barium shaped charges explosive shells shooting barium into space chemtrails from space nobody's talking about it we're talking about it tonight so moving along NASA project cameo NASA creates clouds over Alaska in conducting weather experiment using barium clouds. Project Cameo. Chemically active material ejected into orbit. At the later date, NASA plans to release lithium, another harmless chemical, over northern Scandinavia in a similar experiment. So... These sounding rocket experiments have been going on for quite some time. Nobody seems to know about it. Project Waterhole, interrupting Aurora with water vapor. And as you can see here, field aligned current, sounding rocket goes up, explosive blast here, and they're trying to interrupt the Aurora Borealis with water. Release water vapor into the F region of the ionosphere above Aurora. H2O and CO2 ions dissociatively recombine to produce an ion hole or water hole. Reduce ionospheric conductivity to, and disrupt auroral current system. Disrupting the electrical current system of our planet. Space weather modification. Chemtrails from space. Link, link, link. This was 1981 to 1984. Beam aboard a beam experiment aboard a rocket. Bear. They literally put a particle accelerator on the back of this sounding rocket. And the reason why is as it was going up, burning a hole in the ionosphere. It would accelerate the particles coming out to do what's called radiation belt remediation or shooting radiation from space back to the ground or creating artificial aurora and air glow. Once again, chemtrails from space. July 13th, 1989. Up here, international treaties and active experiments in space. Great care must be exerted so as not to produce widespread, long-lasting, or severe effects because that would be an NMOD treaty violation. NMOD is the Environmental Modification Convention, the Weather Warfare Ban of 1978. So they don't want it to be widespread or long-lasting because that's the verbiage used in NMOD. An ability to reduce trap radiation would increase orbit selection options for future space-based surveillance systems. So what they're talking about is reducing radiation in low Earth orbit. Because if they could reduce the radiation in the low earth orbit or leo part of the ionosphere then they could put spy satellites closer to the ground and get a better look at you fact and you can see that paper right here and of course that is by the u.s air force geophysics laboratory the same individuals who came up with the harp program and you can see this here, Department of Defense HARP Steering Group Joint Services Program, and how they had a nice little meeting on creating HARP in February of 1990. And what do you know, it was called Workshop on Ionospheric Modification and Generation of ELF Waves. And this still involves rockets to this day. So while people talk about HARP, they never mention the fact that HARP works with rockets. Big surprise. 
These were ionospheric heaters available around the planet in 1990 before HARP was created. Fact. So, chemtrails from space, long history on this. This is an especially interesting one. Combined release and radiation effects satellite, CRES, and the Arecibo ionospheric heater, July 1990 to 93. Now, these guys, paper right there, created this satellite to eject the aluminum and barium and trimethyl aluminum and all of these chemicals remotely. And you can see their little logo right here. That's the combined release and radiation effects satellite. Um, and they would heat the chemicals with an ionospheric heater at Arecibo, Puerto Rico. That was later destroyed by a hurricane and then rebuilt. It is now called the Arecibo Observatory Enhanced High Frequency Ionospheric Heating Instrument. So there's a harp in Puerto Rico and they've rebuilt it in the bottom of the big dome that everybody saw in the 007 movie. Those two blue dots are people. These are very big antennas. So, shoot rocket into sky, cook that uh, microwave emission, don't believe me? We'll hop back over here to the map. So, right above Harp, there's a little place you might not have heard of. It's called High Pass. Where is it at? Is it in this? I believe it is. Did I take it out? Tell me I didn't take it out. I must have taken it out. So for that, we will go to Ionosphere Heaters Worldwide. And I will go to the Historic section. One second. And we will go to High Pass. So this is High Pass. And it used to be, let's zoom out, right here between Harp and Poker Flats. We're going to talk about Poker Flats in just a second. But I want to show you this nice little photo right here. Because it pretty much summed, sums everything up. As you can see, rocket. Rocket shoots into sky. Creates aluminum chaff you know, trail, phased array radar, ionospheric heater, cooks that chemical, creates artificial ionospheric mirror. That's how this works in a nutshell. High pass has now been closed down. It's replaced um, by the AMISRs at Poker Flat and obviously HARP. But you can bounce radio waves off of these ionospheric mirrors. Um, you can do all kinds of things, but most people don't want to talk about the rocket aspect of all this, and they're called sounding rockets. So let's go uh, back to the story. Um, so that's high pass, but right here near um, Harp is Poker Flat Rocket uh, Research Range. And you can see that here. Um, this is uh, the front gate sign. The best equipped sounding rocket launch facility in the north established by the Geophysics Institute of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Oh wait, you, the U of A owns HARP now. And to this day, Poker Flat Research Range is the rocket range that works with HARP. This facility is uniquely dedicated to the studies of Aurora Borealis and other atmospheric research studies for the paying customer... <laughs> such as the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, the United States Air Force, the United States Army, the National Science Foundation, and others. First launched from this facility March 1969. So, Poker Flats has been at this for a very long time, and that is what they use whenever they're doing the HARP experiments for sounding rockets. At the Poker Flat Research Range is also a little mini harp called the Poker Flat ISR, or Incoherent Scatter Radar. You can see it here. I mapped a lot of stuff, okay? Um, they also have an imaging rheometer right here. You can see that. I'm not going to zoom in on it. Don't want this video to be too long. You go check out the map yourself. Um, but that's what's going on here. Um, Rockets combined with ionospheric heaters, that's the big picture today. 
back to the story. So triggering the high frequency breakdown of the atmosphere by barium release 1993. See that photo here. And this is by K. Papadopoulos and they talk about HARP in it. Diagnostics using barium injection in conjunction with the HARP ionospheric heater currently underdeveloped will be published elsewhere. So shooting rockets into space using ionospheric heaters like HARP to diagnose and modify the sky. Um, that's the big picture. Moving along, it was also mentioned in weather as a force multiplier owning the weather in 2025. Triggering lightning avoidance for space. Do I have that video up here? Yes. This is a rocket triggered lightning experiments. Yes, they do this sort of thing. Um, they put a wire on the back of a rocket and then they try to catch a lightning bolt with it. You can't make this stuff up. There it is. Lightning bolts are not straight. <laughs> so not only do they use lasers to steer lightning bolts, but they use rockets to steer lightning bolts. Big surprise on that one. Um, but that's what that's all about there. And uh, they mention it in this. And then finally, we're going to go to this, this interesting one right here. This is the charged aerosol release experiment care. Because we all know how much they care when they're releasing their barium and ion, you know, aluminum and all that. So let's look at these four slides. I combine them into one. Come on, zoom for me. Why does it not want to zoom? Okay, we'll just open the image in a new tab and do some zoom in here. All right, so there's your rocket going up. There's your ground-based radar pointing in at the rocket. You get the picture. Here's what it was supposed to look like. Goes up, charged dust particles, dusty plasma, as they like to call it, new artificial dust layer concept. Um, this is the sounding rockets they were using right here. That's a barium trail and a trimethyl aluminum right there. Black Brant 12 rocket. And as you can see right here, artificial noctilucent cloud formation noctilucent clouds are normally formed by meteor dust but we can artificially create them by releasing aluminum barium and other metals into space large concentration of dust from this nico solid rocket motor supersonic injection velocity experiments Ground and ship ionosons, direct injection by chemical release modules. Chemtrails from space is the point of this video. So you can come over to Weather Modification History's News Vault by clicking on newspapers right here. And there's a whole lot more to the story there where you can just scroll on through and see newspapers from 1800 to present. I picked out a certain little selection for you guys, which I will bring up real quick. Operation Smoke Puff set for communications test, 1957. Rockets for civilians, 1960. Page two. Page three. May rockets disturb the weather? Ooh. 1963, new scientist. Man-made comets, artificial comets, plying outer space around the clock are man-made and man-launched. They are finding out what astronauts may run into on their walks in space. Special optical equipment is used to film the behavior of these comets, providing records of the events that are invisible to the human eye. So the Van Allen belts, um and the ionosphere is invisible and that's why these are called tracer experiments just like when you go into the doctor to have mri and they fill you with aluminum or fill you with barium so that they can do mris on you and see things that are invisible the ionosphere is invisible and that's why they do what they do um max planck institute was doing this and they did it with aluminum and barium 
Barium releases at altitudes between 200 and 1,000 kilometers, a joint Max Planck Institute NASA experiment. Case file copy. 1966. NASA to study cloud strata. Using guess what? Trimethyl aluminum form a blue-green cloud. The six rockets were launched from Point Barrow. Will eject and detonate special explosive charges, which will be recorded by radio and sensitive microphones. 1967. Geophysical Institute to study uh, study of Aurora Sprouts space wings in series of rocket shots designed to test influence of Earth's electric field. 1969. NASA rocket produces another barium cloud. 1970. Barium ion cloud due over Central America. Purpose of study to be, purpose of test to study behavior at 20,000 mile altitude, NASA says. Whoa. 1971. This is an actual photo from Poker Flats. This building still is there today. You can go to um, climateviewer.org and see it uh, real quick. Let's go to that. And let's just fly back over to Harp and the optical shelters. They're right here. There's little bubbles on top of this. Don't believe me. There it is. There's the building. This is at the top end of Harp up here at the end of this road. It's called the optical pad. That's what you're seeing in this photo. It's so that they don't freeze their butt off while they're watching their little experiments in space. Gotta love that, right? Um, and this is Space Age Will-O-Wisps. Barium vapor glows 100 miles above Alaska, 1972. West Germany and USSR link up in rocket experiment. 1974. Aladdin on the launch pad. Within the next two weeks, NASA is to launch... 50 sounding rockets in one day in the most ambitious aeronomy experiment ever undertaken. From its results, the international group of researchers involved hopes to gain a far better picture of the Earth's ionosphere and the electric currents flowing through the upper atmosphere. Because you can't see it. It's invisible, so that's why they're doing what they're doing. They're just shooting aluminum and barium into space because it's magnetic and it sticks to magnetic field lines and it allows them to see the invisible. Do they care about the, the health effects of all this? I think not. I certainly think not. Um, anyway, wait a minute, one sec. I think that was it. We got a couple more. Busy winter for Rocketeers, 1976. Skylab's uh, rocket made big hole vandalism in the sky. Coast Bar debates the future of space research. Talking about um, sounding rockets. Plasma, barium plasma paints magnetic field, 1977. Barium release in Alaska traced south, 1978. Firewheel light show prevented by faulty rocket, 1980. Fail. Barium cloud in the sky, like aurora, it will glow, 1980. Cornell University. Comet launched high above Earth where it will explode where it explodes like a bright star. Don't you love these titles? They just make it sound so fancy when they're dumping aluminum and barium in space. Earth's magnetic field yields its secrets in August 1984, an ambitious space mission to investigate the solar wind and Earth's magnetosphere took off from Cape Canaveral. Scientists are now evaluating the data. Boom. But hey, because science, right? Because science. 
Ooh, now we get the color pictures. Gotta love it. 1985, shooting more sounding rockets. There's a nice fo artificial comet. Don't you love that term, the artificial comets? Yeah, 1984. And this is uh, dated 1985 at the top. Gotta love this stuff. More information on it right there. Um, artificial comets. Artificial comet confounds its creators. An observation of an artificial comet have shed new light on the processes that occur both in real comets and in other parts of the universe where comets... Clouds are ionized and magnetized gl gases interact with one another because they did something called the Active Magnetospheric Particle Tracer Explorers, AMPTE mission. Chemtrails from space, 1986. Space cloud release goes off successfully. 1991. Scientists plan glowing gla gas clouds, 1991. 46 years of rockets over Alaska at Poker Flat. University of Alaska Geophysics. University of Fairbanks. Department of, six Department of Defense rockets. NASA U.S. Air Force. I already showed you the photo. You get the picture. Rockets, 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 right? Poker Flat launches five rockets in three nights. This is what they look like. Black Brant rocket. Big trails. Creating artificial aurora. Dumping chemtrails in space. So, this is not a new thing. This has been going on for a long time. And I'd like to show you a couple more things real quickly. Rocket having barium release system to create ion clouds in the upper atmosphere. U.S. patent from current assignee NASA, 1970. But, you know, of course, NASA has no qualms about bragging about their clouds and tracers now because they have an entire section on sounding rockets Tracers, clouds, and trails first used with sounding rockets flown in the 1950s. Scientific research with experiments which inject vapor tracers into the upper atmosphere have greatly aided our understanding of our planet's near space environment. Because science. This is a luminous vapor trail of trimethyl aluminum, or TMA. So this is what an aluminum chemtrail from space looks like this is a lithium chemtrail from space lithium vapor is also used to study neutral winds in the upper atmosphere lithium gas has an unusually bright narrow band emission near blah 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 which enables it to be visible in the daytime with cameras and infrared filters in fact, lithium is the only vapor that can be imaged during the day. So that's why they use lithium, because it's special. It can be seen during the daytime. Barium. Barium's the purple cloud up here, and that's the one that's been mentioned all through this video. So when you talk about chemtrails, and you want to talk about aluminum and barium, and you don't mention rockets, you're really missing the big picture. In fact, in this photo, you have all three. The cloud in the upper left part of the image is due to a barium release, purple. The purple red part is an ionized component which becomes elongated along the Earth's magnetic field lines. So there's a magnetic field line here, and you can see that it stretches itself out along it. That way they can see the invisible. The purple-blue cloud that surrounds the red ionized barium is a combination of neutral barium and strontium. <sighs> There's another thing that everybody talks about with chemtrails. The blue trail, blue and white trail in the lower portion is a result from a TMA or trimethyl aluminum vapor trail that reveals the neutral winds, wind trails as a function of altitude. So... 
lower it's white and then it becomes blue as it gets ionized by you know the sun and solar interaction but regardless chemtrails from freaking space straight up from the nasa sounding rockets section so go over there read all about it nasa has no qualms about bragging about it now um and they're at it all the time in fact there was this Scientists. So then, and you know that this is experimental. You've never done it before. No, it's been done in the 1970s. It's been done in the, recently in the 1990s and 2000s. Oh, that's not what it said on this article here. Three, two, one, zero, plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. It hasn't been done since 1970, the lithium release in the daytime. Why would it be done now then, sir? Why would it be done right now? Because they can see it during the daytime and they love testing the atmosphere. Because science, right? Lithium niobrate, right there. That's scary. Uh, detailed information. If you could please send your comments by email. Okay, you'd like, will you respond to my email if I send them? Happy to answer them, yes. You will. Okay, what was your email, sir? Douglas.e.roland. Douglas. D-O-U-G-L-A-S. Douglas. I'm sorry? E. Uh-huh. .roland. R-O-W-L-A-N-D. Uh-huh. At, uh... NASA.gov. I'm sorry? NASA.gov. N-A-S-A dot G-O-V. Okay. Well, I will be expecting an email back from you then, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's very important. We, we, we communicate what we're doing to the public. We're very interested in making sure everyone knows what we're doing. We're not, um, we're a civilian space agency dedicated to science and research and so on. So we're very, uh, very keen to make sure that the taxpayers know what we're doing and everything. So. Well, you know, when the, when the article came out in the major newspapers, including the Huffington Post, there was no mention of lithium, not one, not one mention of lithium until I heard the recording of the actual, I, I listened to it. I, listened. I just want to pause for a second. Although this audio is great, that's fuel dumping. That's, that's a plane dumping fuel out of its wingtip. So doesn't have a damn thing to do with this video. <laughs> Um, or what they're talking about with sounding rockets and lithium, but the audio is priceless. That's why I'm playing it. I can't help who edited this video and put air fuel dumping into the background, but let's continue. Listen to the rockets go off. I had no idea there was going to be a lithium dispersed until I heard payload lithium disperse. Good indicators of chemical deploys. And lithium monetary improved vine have been deployed. Okay. RSO TD OSS request to declare the area clear and release the roadblocks. TD concurs if RSO does. RSO concurs. Oh, my copies. Yeah, the science team reports out that they do see the lithium trails. These lithium trails allow them to look at the winds and that uh, of the ionosphere. And uh, these winds are believed to be the carriers of the dynamic. PM. Uh, well, make sure everyone knows that we see the lithium from the airplane. Roger that. We've got good sine waves on the electric field. PI copies. Right. There was lithium dispersed, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I think you might be under some misconceptions about what we're doing, but I'm happy to tell you any details that you need. Well, I know that it says in your article that you're doing it for communications. Okay, I'm happy to talk to you more about it. There, there are many reasons we're doing it. Okay. We don't understand how the wind in the upper atmosphere moves. Mm -hmm. In these chemtrails, there's different kinds of chemtrails, as you probably know. Different trails at night we use and different trails during the day. The wind blows them around. They glow either on their own or from scattered sunlight. We take pictures and we can see how the wind trail moves around. And we use that to, to infer what the wind is. Just like if you were taking a picture of an airplane contrail. Okay, so 
these slides are from a totally different thing. I'll probably do a video on that too, just to explain what these slides are. These slides are completely unrelated to the audio, but you just heard the NASA guy say, yes, we're doing lithium. Yes, we're doing it to see the winds at upper atmosphere. It's just like what happens with contrails. We can see the wind. So is it possible that airplanes are making white lines all over the sky because they want to do tracer experiments from space and be able to see where the wind's blowing? I don't know. Um, that's a distinct possibility as well because that's what they've been doing for 60 years with the sounding rockets. Regardless, this is from a potential threats in the future um, slideshow. I don't know why they overlaid this. This is how things get all confused together. But regardless, the important thing is this NASA scientist had no issue with calling these chemtrails because that's exactly what they are. They are chemtrails from space. Um, and that's what's been going on for quite some time. Got a nice long list right here. Suborbital atmospheric research rockets. This list is so freaking lengthy. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, and the funny thing is, I thought this was actually a list of all of the sounding rocket experiments. But it turns out, this is a guy who's actually just covering stamps. <laughs> so these are just r sounding rockets that have stamps associated with it. I mean, you can see the pictures by clicking on them. Um, there's the stamps, you know what I mean? So then I was like, oh, derp. Um, but regardless, if there's that many stamps made about sounding rockets, can you imagine how many sounding rockets have actually gone off? I mean, this page is extremely lengthy. Suborbital research rockets in the lower atmosphere. And the list goes on and on. The, the video we just watched was from Wallops Island, Virginia. So that's where they were doing the lithium release that they were talking about. Um, they were... It was called Atrex. Um, I actually have that in my Chemtrails from Space uh, video series. You can come over here and actually see the, the launch information on that just by clicking right here. Uh, NASA Jet Stream Studies Lights in the Night Sky. Lighting the Sky Atrex launches. Um, there you go. Five small rockets. Two, one. Zero. We have launched the Terrier Oriole. And there's the, the, the launches, yada, yada, yada. So that was called Atrex, and they've done a couple of these from Wallop since. But that's the big picture. Um, sounding rockets from space, and nobody's talking about it. Aluminum and barium dumped into space for many years, but this is the future. U.S. Air Force plans to plasma bomb the sky for HARP. And that's where we're at now. And there were several articles written about it. U.S. Air Force wants to detonate plasma bombs in the sky. They're no longer called comets or will-o'-wisps. It's just straight up plasma bombing. Not plasma seeding. Plasma bombing. Once again, there's my... Harry Wexler's warning. Um, U.S. Air Force wants to plasma bomb the sky using tiny satellites. They're called CubeSats. So that's where we're at today. Not only are they still using the sounding rockets, they're still using satellites like the Sea Res thing that they did with Arecibo back in the 90s. Um, the U.S. Air Force has these cube sets or mini sets with vaporized metals in them. And they're going to continue to do this. Forget cloud seeding. Air Force wants to plant plasma bombs in the sky with tiny satellites. So you guys got to understand that while a, there's a lot of conjecture and a lot of people mixing up different parts of the facts, 
If you don't understand the big picture, if you don't see the history behind chemtrails from space, sounding rockets, aluminum, barium, trimethyl aluminum, lithium, sulfur hexafluoride, all of this stuff, then we're going to be doomed to just repeat this history forever. And nobody will do anything about it. U.S. Air Force plan to improve radio communications. Plasma bomb the atmosphere. So that's that's the big picture guys um even in my first article the one uh, that i started out with aluminum barium and chemtrails from space at the very bottom of it i have um the stuff from the sea res launches and you can see this right here combined release and radiation effects satellite same thing that they're talking about with the air force but plasma bombs in the sky and what do they show Here's all of the experiments, chemicals, location, altitude, and period. What do you see? Strontium and barium, calcium and barium, 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 lithium, 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 barium, 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 barium. You get the picture. SF6, the banned CFC known as the strongest destroyer of ozone. They have no problem launching it 240 miles into the sky July through August of 1990. Sulfur hexafluoride. No shame. Barium, 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 SF6, SF6. Ionospheric focused heating from Puerto Rico at the Arecibo Ionospheric Heater. So that's it. Chemtrails from space, aluminum, barium. And how they've been dumping aluminum and barium in space for 60 plus years and nobody's talking about it to this day. I hope that you guys will spread the word about this because there's a very large community of people concerned about chemtrails. Douglas over there had, the NASA guy had no shame at all in calling them chemtrails, but you're supposed to put a tinfoil hat on. And the reason why is because all anybody ever talks about is how Delta Airlines and white unmarked planes are spraying barium and aluminum. But nobody is talking about the sounding rockets. And if you knew this history and you were to look your senator in the face and show them this information, there's, it's undeniable. These are facts. And these types of facts are the kind of facts that are necessary for us to move this movement forward. So... I hope that the next time somebody mentions the, the word chemtrails and says something about aluminum and barium that you go, hey man, have you ever heard of a sounding rocket? Diane has a question. Where does the spent sounding rocket debris go? Does it become space garbage or does the rocket fall back to earth? Good question. Um, a lot of these do fall back to earth some of them become space junk and of course any of the ones that are shaped barium charges they just explode in space so i imagine there's just shards of metal floating around up there from those um but like that care project the charged aerosol release experiment it was designed to be recoverable with a parachute so they can use them over and over again so just like the rockets that you can buy from, you know, your local, you know, store, Amazon, you know, whatever. Um, rocket goes up, parachute comes out, rocket comes down. The whole purpose of this is that the rocket's exhaust is loaded with aluminum and all of these chemicals that bore holes in the ionosphere and are usually filled with metallic particles that are magnetic in, in nature. So they stick to the invisible ionosphere and that allows them to see what's invisible and then cook it with microwaves like HARP, like Arecibo's heater and all of the other ionospheric heaters around the globe. As you can see, there are many of them. So all of these ionospheric heaters around the globe typically have a you know rocket launch facility nearby up here at Tromso in Norway is the Andoya rocket range um, 
I'm going to map out all the rocket ranges. Why not? I'll do that in a future video so you guys can check that out. But, I, great question, Diane. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is the big picture. Sounding rockets work with ionospheric heaters. And if you're not going to talk about the two and how they're related, if you're going to talk about aluminum and barium, remember that, in my personal opinion, the, ma the vast majority of aluminum and barium and strontium and these types of chemicals that we're seeing in the sky today are raining down from space because the higher you shoot a thing into the atmosphere, the longer it stays there before it comes down. And if you've been spraying it into space for 60, 70 years, it's going to rain down. It's going to rain down for a very long time to come. So the question remains, when will they stop? And that's why I have proposed something called the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. Because even though weather warfare was banned in 1978, there's still no way to catch people in the act. So this is an act to end atmospheric experimentation without notification. I hope that you guys will come over to climateviewer.com slash nmod, see my solution, understand that geoengineering is already banned. Um, this is a fact. It's an undeniable fact. Um, geoengineering was banned at the Convention for Biological Diversity, and that was in 2012. So geoengineers are already banned. Weather warfare is already banned. Um, it's right here. Uh, Article 14 of the convention. Let me zoom in on that. So everybody at home can see same time. That no climate geoengineering activities that may affect biodiversity take place until there is an adequate scientific basis on which to justify such activities and appropriate consideration of the associated risks for environmental and biodiversity and associated social, economic, and cultural impacts with exception of small-scale scientific research studies that would be conducted in a controlled setting in accordance with blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Whoa. So, geoengineering is banned. The United States did not sign this agreement. Um, bans don't work. And that's why I've proposed my solution, the Environmental Modification Accountability Act, because it's one thing to ban a thing, but it's a totally another thing to catch somebody in the act. And that's why if you come and you check out my solution, you can see the 10 technologies that are in use today to modify the weather on a worldwide scale. Sounding rockets right there. Ionospheric heaters, sounding rockets, satellites are one, two, and three. That's what we talked about tonight in this video. And if you look at my PowerPoint presentation, you'll realize that, you know, bands are already in place. These major players are at it no, no matter what bands are in place. And what we're looking for here is transparency and verification. How do we catch NMOD violators without the proper tools to do so? And if we catch people violating NMOD, the weather warfare ban, who enforces sanctions and penalties? How do we stop this? That's the big picture. I hope that you guys will look at the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. Understand what it takes to understand if somebody's being hostile or not, if they're causing widespread or long-lasting effects, and how we go about catching people with a sensor network. Because transparency matters, but trust but verify we have to actually catch these people in the act and at first we can legally say uh you know why not ban it all together bans don't work um they're too big to fail there's so much money involved in this water strap states won't give up this technology and humans are just by nature controlling individuals especially scientists they don't give a damn because science so we, we must have a verification system. 
we must come up with a sensor network. And that's what Climate Viewer is all about. A citizen-powered Earth-observing sensor network in your backyard. Um, if I ever get enough support financially, my intention is to create rainwater sampling equipment, all sky cameras, and EMF sensing equipment that goes in your backyard and displays it in real time on um, a map like Climate Viewer. So you can see things like air quality worldwide um, in real time and go, hey, you know, the rainfall shows a whole lot of barium in this area. And the EMF is off the chart in this area. Things like that. So that's the idea behind Climate Viewer. That's the idea behind my solution. I hope that you guys will understand that this weather modification project problem isn't just as simple as chemtrails and airplanes and making clouds. There are many technologies. And if you're not talking about sounding rockets and the barium and aluminum and strontium coming from space, then you're missing the big picture. I hope that this video resonates with you. I hope that you have now seen the big picture. And I understand that this video is long because in order to understand these big complex ideas, you need to know the whole picture. So for the very few of you who will sit all the way through this video and try to understand it, it's now your job to spread the word little by little, make your own videos, use some of this material, but at the very least tell people about chemtrails from space. And remember, while you're doing that, to attack ideas, not people. If this video resonates with you, leave me a comment because I love hearing from y'all. First time here? Be sure to subscribe and click the bell. The bell doesn't always work, so come to ClimateViewer.com and sign up for our newsletter. Remember, it would be impossible for me to do this without your support, so please join my Patreon or buy me a coffee on PayPal. And always, attack ideas, not people.